In this video, I would like to present a brief introduction to the growth model of Robert Solo and Trevor Swan. You can find the original sources here, the articles published by Robert Solo in 1957 and by Trevor Swan in 1956. And the textbook uh, treatment basically would be uh, chapter four of the book that I've written together with David Bloom, Automation and its Macroeconomic Consequences, Theory, Evidence and Social Impacts. Before we start, it's important to know what the growth model of Solo and Swan aims to explain. And uh, therefore, I present here some of the stylized facts of economic growth that um, basically need an explanation. What we see here is the development of the United States and of Germany in terms of per capita GDP over the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. And per capita GDP is um, in logarithms uh, presented here. The red line refers to the United States and the blue line uh, to Germany. And what we see is that there are three main features. First of all, there seems to be a constant rate of economic growth in both economies over the very long run to some extent. So you see here the linear trend, that's the um, dotted line here for Germany and the dotted line here for the United States. And uh, the trend is increasing and it's remarkably similar in the United States and in Germany over these um, uh, yeah, over this uh, time span, it only differs by a very small amount, actually. Now, that's interesting because these two countries faced very different shocks over these uh, time periods. For example, you see here the Second World War that had a much more severe impact on the German economy than it had on the United States economy, of course, because it was fought on German soil and the capital stock was uh, destroyed to some extent. Lots of people died and so on. So, uh, therefore, uh, the Second World War had a much um, more severe impact in Germany. Nevertheless, in the long run, these two economies seem to grow at a remarkably similar rate. So that's the first stylized fact. The second stylized fact is that there seems to be a persistent gap between the two economies that does not vanish over time with the United States having a higher per capita GDP throughout the whole period that we observe here in uh, Germany, a uh, lower per capita GDP. And the third remarkable feature here is the base at which Germany recovered after the Second World War. That's often called the economic miracle in Germany. And as we will see, basically, when we talk about the growth model of Solo and so on, that's actually what the model uh, predicts, and we will see why this is the case. So the three stylized facts that we aim to explain is the remarkable constant long-run growth rate, the constant gap between the two economies in the long run, and the fast catch-up growth that Germany experienced after the Second World War. A starting point when thinking about economic growth might be the observation that usually economic growth goes hand in hand with an increase in the productive capital of an economy. So that means productive capital are factory buildings, machines, infrastructure, boards and roads and so on. And if an economy grows quickly, then there is a lot of construction going on, firms open and so on and so forth. So these two things, uh, capital accumulation and economic growth, seem to be correlated. In addition, if we look at cross-country differences, then rich countries typically exhibit a lot of productive capital, a lot of factories, uh, machines, and so on and so forth. And in poor economies, there's usually uh, not so much um, of that. So a basic idea might be that economic growth is driven by capital accumulation. And we will now see, in terms of the solo model, uh, what capital accumulation actually can explain in terms of economic growth and what it can not explain in terms of economic growth. So for what we need additional explanations. The first thing that we have to do when we want to formalize the idea that physical capital accumulation drives economic growth is to define how output is produced in an economy. And if we assume a closed economy, then aggregate output would be equal to the GDP of a country, and we know, denote it by uppercase Y. Now, we have that output is a function of the production inputs, and here we have capital, so that's the productive capital that I've mentioned earlier. We have labor, denoted by L, and we have labor productivity, 
denoted by A. And the exponents in the production function are alpha, uh, which is the output elasticity of capital, and 1 minus alpha, which is the output elasticity of uh, labor, basically, here. Now, alpha is usually assumed to be between 0 and 1, and this parameter can be estimated. In an economy with perfectly competitive markets, the output elasticity of capital would be equal to the share of total income that goes to the production factor capital. And over long periods of uh, history, for example, in the United States, alpha had been around one third. Since the 1980s, however, alpha has been increasing a bit and is now about uh, 0.4. Now, what we assume to isolate the role of capital in the production process and in economic growth is that first we um, assume that labor does not grow, so it's constant. And we assume that it is equal to the population size. So we abstract from unemployment, retirement, childhood, and so on and so forth. And we also assume that labor productivity is constant and we normalize it to one. In this case, we uh, do not need to consider it anymore in this basic version of the solar model. And then capital is accumulated. So capital itself can grow by investment. So firms invest in new machines, firms invest in new factories, the government might invest in building roads and boards and so on and so forth. And that's how capital increases. And we will then look what this increase in capital um, uh, implies for uh, per capita GDP, for increases in GDP and increases in per capita. Next, we need to define how investment basically works. Now, if we assume a closed economy and say we abstract from a um, public sector, then we know that the total output can either be consumed or invested. This follows from the standard national income identity for a closed economy without a public sector that one knows from standard introductory macro economics causes. So output can either be consumed or invested. Now, how is investment um, determined? Well, here we assume that individuals in the economy save a constant fraction of their total income. And total income is equal to total production, again, by the national income identity, where you can um, compute GDP either by means of the total value of the goods and services that are produced within a country or by the value of the total incomes that are generated in an economy. And if a fraction of this total income is saved, then this is also the fraction that is invested because we have a closed economy and no government. And that means that total investment is equal to total savings. That's also the IS identity that you already know from standard macroeconomics courses. Now, S is assumed to be exogenously given in the standard solo swarm model. One could endogenize it, which is done in the ramsey kass koopmans framework, for example, in continuous time or in an overlapping generations model in uh, discrete time. This basically makes um, the model more realistic, but also much more complicated. And the insights, the additional insights um, are basically uh, of such models are basically the same as the standard solo swarm model where S is taken as exogenous and as a parameter that can be again estimated. And in standard economies, that would be the gross investment rate, so the rate um, at which um, income is invested, reinvested in the economy before depreciation is taken into account. Well, investment determines the evolution of the capital stock. So if more is invested in a country, then the productive capital stock increases um, more quickly. So how can we describe this process? Here we define net investment as the change in the capital stock of an economy over time. So we have basically here a dot over the variable, and this dot means the derivative with respect to time. So capital depends on time because it changes over time. And if we take the derivative of capital with respect to time, then what we get is the change in the capital stock. And this change is net investment after depreciation is taken into account.
Now this change is given by gross investment before depreciation minus the part of the capital stock that depreciates over time. And the rationale for that is that, of course, at each moment in time, a certain fraction of the capital stock wears out. So machines, for example, break down and have to be um, replenished. Uh, production facilities may, may wear down, uh, roads need to be reconstructed, and so on and so forth. So capital wears out, and the rate at which capital wears out is given by delta, another parameter in the model. And then we can write down the accumulation equation for capital. So net investment, the change in the capital stock of an economy, is the difference between gross investment minus depreciation, the part of the capital stock that depreciates. Now, if gross investment is higher than depreciation, so if, the, if a country invests more than uh, bears out at each point in time, then the right-hand side of this equation is positive. That means the change in the capital stock is positive and capital accumulates, increases over time. By contrast, if a country invests um, only quite a little, such that gross investment is lower than depreciation, then this right-hand side is negative, meaning that the change in the capital stock is negative, meaning that capital decumulates. Now, the capital stock in the same period cannot be changed, and that means capital is a predetermined variable, or in other words, a state variable in such a model. Now we can summarize the model equations. Here we have aggregate output by means of the Douglas production function where we normalize productivity to 1 and here we also omit the time index just for simplicity reasons. Then we have uh, gross investment that's a fraction of total income, income being equal to aggregate production and the share of investment and savings is between 0 and 1. Then we know that aggregate output can be used for consumption and savings. And we have net investment as the difference between gross investment and depreciation. L itself is exogenous and constant, and the initial capital stock is given. The next step is to transform the model equations in per capita terms, because we are not so much interested in the evolution of aggregate GDP of a country, but much more interested in the evolution of a per capita GDP, which is aggregate GDP divided by the population size. And now, uh, with a similar argument, we would have here capital per worker as the aggregate capital stock divided by the number of employees. Now, by using um, expression 1 from the previous slide, so the production function of aggregate output, we can compute per capita GDP. So that's equal to the production function divided by the number of workers. If we do this division, then we see that L drops out in the numerator, and we would have L to the power of alpha in the denominator. We can put this together with the K to the power of alpha from the uh, numerator and would have k divided by l to the power of alpha. And since we have this definition here, that lowercase k is uppercase k divided by uppercase l, we have that per capita GDP is lowercase k to the power of alpha. So that means that per capita GDP in the economy increases with the capital intensity of the economy. So with the number of machines that are available per worker. However, this increase is diminishing because alpha is smaller than 1. That means that if we accumulate more capital and hold the number of workers constant, then production increases, but at a diminishing rate because um, basically it uh, becomes more and more difficult for the existing number of workers to operate these all additional machines that enter the economy. Now we also need to transform the capital accumulation equation equation 4 on the slide where we summarized the model equations. And uh, first we reformulate it. So we plug into this expression um, the behavioral uh, equation for investment, so that gross investment is equal to a fraction of total income that is invested, because that's the fraction that is saved in the economy. And for income itself, we can plug in uh, from equation number one, uh, aggregate output, because that's equal to aggregate income. And we get the capital accumulation equation in this form, where we have the change in the capital stock on the left-hand side. So that's net investment. And we have 
basically a function of the aggregate capital stock on the right hand side. However, what we want to have is actually an expression that um, is in per capita terms. So we divide by the number of workers this expression. So we get capital stock divided by the number of workers. And here, if we have no population growth and no technological progress, then this is equal to the evolution of the capital intensity, so the time derivative of lowercase k. This would not be the case, however, if the population size were allowed to grow. In this case, one would have to apply the quotient rule uh, of calculus to calculate the evolution of um, the capital intensity. Here, however, it's simpler. We just divide this expression by L and immediately have the evolution of the capital intensity. So that means we also divide the right-hand side by L. Now we already know if we divide the production function by L, then um, this L in the numerator cancels out. We have K over L to the power of alpha, and we have here K over L, and then we can just summarize it in this equation where we substitute out for all the expressions with uppercase K divided by uppercase L. We put instead lowercase K, the capital intensity, and then we would have this so-called fundamental equation of the solo Swan model. So that's the evolution of the capital stock per capita, or capital intensity in the economy, and this is positively related to gross investment per capita, so that's this expression, and negatively related to depreciation per capita. Again, if gross investment per capita is higher than depreciation per capita, the capital intensity increases, because then the right-hand side is positive, and the change over time is positive, and by contrast, if a gross investment is lower than depreciation per capita, then the change of K over time is negative, so we have capital decumulation per capita. Now this is a summary of what we said before, so that's the interpretation of the fundamental equation. We have uh, that lowercase k, the time derivative is the change in the capital intensity, so that's net investment per capita. This term here is gross investment per capita, and this term here is depreciation per capita, and the change in capital intensity over time is fully determined by these components. Now we are in the position of analyzing the solo swan model by means of a graph. Here we plot on the vertical axis output per capita or per capita GDP, and on the horizontal axis the capital intensity. The first thing that we draw in this graph is per capita GDP depending on the capital intensity. This is a concave function basically because we have uh, that k is raised to the power of alpha and alpha is smaller than 1. So here we have this graphical depiction that shows that if the capital intensity in the economy is rather small, then an increase in capital increases production quite a lot. So the slope of this function here is rather steep at the origin. However, if we increase capital more and more, then the slope becomes flatter and flatter and flatter. And as k goes to infinity, basically the slope would become flat. So for a constant number of workers, the additional output that we can get by employing ever more machines goes to zero. The next line that we draw in the diagram is the gross investment curve. So that's basically a fraction of total income per capita because gross investment per capita is the saving rate, which is between zero and one, multiplied by income per capita. Then we can draw the depreciation line. That's capital per worker that wears out and this is a straight line from the origin, because if the capital stock is zero, then nothing can depreciate, but the greater the capital stock uh, becomes per worker, the more can depreciate, and since the rate of depreciation is constant, the increase in the amount that can depreciate at each point in time is linear from uh, the origin. Now this means that at some point in the interior of this graph, the gross investment curve would intersect with the depreciation curve. And exactly at this point, the capital stock per worker does not change anymore, because here investment is exactly 
so high that it can compensate for depreciation, but not higher. So you can compensate for the capital that wears out at each point in time, but you cannot accumulate more capital. That's the so-called steady state, because at this point, the capital intensity stays constant. If we are to the left of the steady state, we see that uh, gross investment is higher than depreciation. So here, the capital stock, the capital intensity would increase. And to the right, the capital intensity would decrease because here depreciation is higher than gross investment. And now we can see what happens if we start with a capital stock at time zero that is lower than the steady state capital stock. In this case, we start to the left of the steady state. And we see that at this point, gross investment is higher than depreciation. That means that capital accumulation is positive, net investment is positive, and the capital stock would increase over time. That means we would converge from the left to the steady state level of the capital stock per worker. And when the capital stock per worker increases, then we also see from the production function that output per worker would increase. So from here to the steady state, output per worker would increase. However, once we reach the steady state, then capital does not increase anymore and also output per worker does not increase anymore. So in this simple version of the solo swan model without technological progress, economic growth would cease at the point uh, where we reach the steady state. So the economy would not grow further uh, and capital accumulation alone cannot explain in this sense perpetual long-run growth. However, as long as we are outside of the steady state, we would have growth. And the further away from the steady state we are, the faster is capital accumulation. And the higher is also the increase in output that we can get from an additional unit of capital. So what the solar model implies here is that countries that are farther away from their steady state level of the capital stock would grow faster. This holds to the left of the steady state capital stock. However, we could also analyze what happens if we are to the right of the steady state capital stock. In this case, depreciation is higher than gross investment, meaning that the capital stock would decrease here. And we would converge to the steady state level of the capital stock from above. And during this convergence from above, we would have a decrease in capital intensity and correspondingly a decrease in per capita GDP. Now, in terms of interpretation, we could uh, think about the following scenario. We have a country that is at the steady state, and then a disaster happens or a war such that the capital stock or a large part of the capital stock gets destroyed. This country then gets thrown out of the steady state and would end up to the left of the steady state capital intensity at some point. So it would have a lower capital intensity than at the steady state, but then gross investment would exceed depreciation and capital accumulation would be rather fast. So such a country would then face reconstruction and fast capital accumulation and therefore rather fast or comparatively fast uh, per capita GDP growth. And per capita GDP growth would then slow down as the country again approaches its, its initial steady state. And these mechanisms can help to some extent explain what happens in, happened in Germany after the Second World War. So a capital stock, um, a lot of the capital stock was destroyed and then the country faced reconstruction and uh, a rather fast increase in per capita GDP over the next uh, decades. And part of this mechanism might be explained by the solo model, but of course there were also other things, um, the Marshall Plan, uh, people moving back to uh, Germany and so on and uh, so forth that also contributed, of course. But the basic mechanism is um, yeah, explained by the solar model here for the so-called um, economic miracle. After we have explained catch-up phases after wars or disasters by means of um, the convergence process in the solar model, we would now like to analyze what can explain cross-country income differences. And the first experiment that we do in terms of the solo model is that we change the parameter of the rate of depreciation and looks what the implications uh, would be. Now suppose for uh, um, the sake of a presentation that the rate of depreciation decreases. 
Now in this case, the depreciation line would rotate clockwise around the origin and would therefore intersect with the gross investment curve at a higher level of the steady state capital stock. So if the depreciation rate would decrease for some reason, we would then observe um, capital accumulation from the old level, the old steady state level, to the new steady state level. So kind of that's akin to the convergence um, phase that we've described earlier. But now this would be induced by a change in an underlying parameter. Or by contrast, if we assume that there are two countries, one with a higher rate of depreciation and one with a lower rate of depreciation, then we would see that the country with the a higher rate of depreciation has a lower per capita GDP than the country with uh, the lower rate of depreciation. So this was one parameter change in the solo model with the rate of depreciation, but it could be argued that in reality the rate of depreciation does not really change over time or it's rather the same across countries because why should the machine wear out at a faster rate in say uh, Germany than in Australia or something like that. Um, however, another change that might be even more important, that that's a change in the investment rate or saving rate across countries. Assume again for the sake of this illustration that a country starts with a lower saving rate and then the saving rate increases from S to S prime. In this case, the gross investment curve would rotate counterclockwise um, around the origin and would now intersect the uh, depreciation line again at the higher level of the steady state capital stock. And again, if this happens within one country, then after the increase in the saving rate, the country would start to converge to the new steady state capital stock. So we would have capital accumulation and growth during this period of convergence. And again, if you look at two different countries, one with a lower saving rate and one with a higher saving rate, then the country with the lower saving rate would have a lower level of per capita GDP. So these two experiments can to some extent explain cross-country differences in the level of income that could be persistent over time. So what are now the central implications of the solo swan model? First of all, the first main insight is that long-run economic growth cannot be explained solely by physical capital accumulation. Why? The reason is that at some point the country converges to the steady state and then capital does not accumulate anymore and per capita GDP um, ceases to grow. Now technically the steady state is only reached as time goes to infinity, but for all practical reasons, if you calibrate such a model for example and simulate it, you would see that um, after a few periods, say uh, decades or so in the model, uh, the growth rate of per capita GDP would not be distinguishable from zero anymore. Now, the problem is we want to explain long-run growth, as we've seen in the graph at the beginning. Uh, now, what could explain long-run growth in a model? The solution is to allow productivity growth. For example, we assume technological progress at a constant rate, and if we do so and assume that um, there is technological progress at rate G, then this would be the rate at which countries grow in the long run. So then we would have a constant growth rate of all the countries, and this constant growth rate would be due to technological progress. We can explain periods of strong growth after wars and disasters by the convergence mechanisms, and we can explain level differences across countries by differences in the structural parameters. Here in the simple version of the model, the saving rate and the rate of depreciation, but there are augmented versions of the solo model where you would also have human capital accumulation and parameters related to the speed of human capital accumulation and so on and so forth that would also contribute to this understanding of cross-country differences. Now, what does this mean in terms of the graph that we had at the beginning to motivate the analysis by means of the solo swan model? Uh, we can explain the trend in the long run increase in per capita GDP between Germany and the United States by technological progress. So productivity growth is the force that drives per capita GDP increases in the long run. 
And since productivity growth and technological progress is kind of um, happening at the global level, we would then uh, expect that two countries that are at the technological frontier grow at the same uh, rate or um, a rate that is remarkably similar. So that would explain this long-run uh, trend. The period after the Second World War, this economic miracle, would be explained by the convergence forces of the solo mode. So here, uh, the economy in Germany was kind of, um, the capital stock was destroyed, was far away from the steady state, and afterwards capital accumulation at the fast base set in again during the reconstruction, which was helped by the Marshall Plan and so on and so forth. So this period can be explained by convergence. And finally, the differences in the levels of per capita GDP in the long run could in principle be explained by differences in the structural parameters. Well, now I've said pretty much everything that I wanted to say with respect to the basic solo model, and I'd like to thank you for your attention.